Unexplained animal mutilations, the platyhelimenthes hypotheses. A video response to the work of Richard D. Hall by Edmund Matthews. It is important before watching this video to watch the documentary entitled Silent Killings by Richard D. Hall. In addition, it would be useful to watch his subsequent films Silent Killers in Sussex and other films he has made on the subject. This will give you an understanding of the nature and frequency of this phenomenon. In this video, I'll be using some of his work to give the viewer only a brief explanation of it. Okay, I'll just summarise what the phenomenon is. Throughout the world, including parts of the UK, since at least 1954, animals known to be in perfect physical health are found dead with very peculiar injuries on and inside their bodies. The nature of the injuries is surgical and cannot be explained by animal predation. This has been confirmed by pathologists. Where I disagree with Mr. Richard D. Hall is in that he states that this phenomenon could not be caused as a result of predation. Indeed, no large creature with a large singular mouth could create such tidy wounds. However, it is my contention that many thousands of tiny little mouths could. It is my contention that what is being seen here is the after effects of an infection by an unknown platyhelimenthes. Although thousands of cases worldwide are known about, no human being has ever been seen, caught or arrested for mutilation incidents. Bright orange or white spheres of light are sometimes witnessed in the areas where animals are found. It is my contention that the military interest in this phenomenon is due to their desire to weaponize it and to create a very fearful bioweapon. Furthermore, I suggest that the notion of the involvement of extraterrestrials is actively encouraged by the military as part of the cover-up of the investigation and weaponization of this parasite. Imagine waking up in an army barracks and the soldier next to you in his bed is dead. With his blood gone, his ass hollowed out, organs removed as if by magic and the flesh around his jaw eaten away. Also imagine the panic and chaos amongst the public if such a parasite was unleashed on the general population. There's a difference of opinion about the Ripley. Really? Who has an opinion? Who do you think? General Matheson. Three star. General Matheson. Three. When did you see him? They called me in yesterday. I see. And what is the vaulted opinion of those enlightened cocksuckers who have never been within three states of an ET? They say the fungus doesn't take hold on all the victims. Some of them just get over it. Really? What about the shit weasels? The ones blasting out the basement door. Does Matheson think that folks get over one of those puppies? The theory they're working on is the creatures will only grow in a small percentage of the exposed population. Do you like that theory, Bucko? Your um, flesh stripped. There's a hole in his right arm where um, muscle material was, was removed through that hole. Um, there's a hole in the side of his head here where his brain was removed. Um, and again, you can see there in his stomach area, organs were removed from his stomach. Uh, he had the rectal core, which is the same as the, the sheep and, and cattle experience. And you can see this, the hole in his stomach here and in his leg, and his internal lungs were removed through those small holes. And Tony, Tony Fremont, the pathologist working for the APFU, and he's a human pathologist, he said, I don't see how we can do this when you looked at those photographs. So that, that's a summary of the phenomenon. When an animal attacks another animal in a predatory type scenario, the animal that's trying to escape, its heart's pumping fast. So generally, a fox will, or, or whatever will go for the neck and blood is spilt because of, because, basically because of the struggle. And predation attacks like this, they're a mess. So you have blood on the ground, you have blood on the carcass, and just generally the throat. So it, it's blood and guts and there's a, there's a mess. And, and these incidents, none of them are anything like this. Okay, so just pointing out what predation looks like. Characteristics in mutilation cases, sometimes it's just some of them. So starting at the top right, often, Animals that are in perfect health one day, the following day, they'll be found in this position where they've got jaw flesh stripped very, very cleanly down to the bone, and it's generally just off one side. The tongue is extremely cleanly excised with a sharp implement. It's, it's, it's provably not bitten off or took off by a predator. Eyes, often one eye is removed. Organs are often removed from the throat, such as the esophagus. And quite often there are um, puncture wounds found in the ventral neck area where seemingly all of the animal's blood is drained. I'll, I'll come on to that. Um, and one of the classic signs is that small holes are cut into the body. And I'll also 
speak about that in more detail, generally on the abdomen, where large organs are removed from very small holes. To say organs removed is an assumption. It would be more accurate to say that the organs are not present. The ravenous wasp larva will eat the aphid alive from the inside out. The sex organs are often removed and we see that in the middle, what we call a rectal core, where the animal's rectum, there's a hole maybe the size of a 50 pence piece or a little bit bigger, the sealed edge, the entire rectum is removed from that, from that orifice. Uh, and smaller animals tend to have holes in the center of their head and quite often the animal's entire brain, internal organs and spinal column are removed through a 10 pence piece size hole in the center of their head. Uh, and also ears are often cleanly excised and it's usually just one ear but I will come on to that a little bit later. Now I mentioned the jaw strip. Now, David Caton visited an abattoir a while back and the guy at the abattoir said in order to get an animal's jaw that clean with, with all of the muscle and all of the tissue away from the jaw would take high pressure steam and it would take quite a long time before you could remove all of the tissue to get it in that sort of condition. Okay, so I showed that picture to a farmer uh, a few weeks ago and she said, oh, well, a badger's done that. So the farmers, they come out with these explanations, you know, without really n knowing, you know, uh, badgers generally go for the liver, they rip the carcass open, they go for the liver and the heart. They wouldn't spend hours nibbling away at a jaw to get it stripped clean like that. There's another example, this was in West Wales, that's a ram. And look how clean the flesh is from that, from that jaw. This, this photograph, incidentally, was censored for four years by Devon Police. Mike Freebury went through a, a legal battle submitting freedom of information requests and it took him four years to get that photograph off Devon Police. And as I said, the tongue's removed cleanly. And usually, um, the animal is dead when the tongue is removed. This is shown because there's no blood in the mouth. Um, so the heart wasn't pumping when the, when the tongue was cut off. And, it, and like I said before, neat edged circular holes. Now these holes, they're sometimes circular, but they're quite often teardrop shaped. If you just look to the left hand side on that diagram, I'll zoom in a little bit. You can see it's sort of a teardrop shaped hole and quite often the edges are sealed in a way that w wouldn't occur if it was just made with a sharp implement. So some pathologists that have got involved with this, and it's, it's very few, um, believe that either a very sharp knife or laser has been used along with high heat. And it's the high heat which creates this almost perfect seal. And this next case, this was a lamb. And you can, if you just zoom in there, the, the, the fur around the wound has actually been you know, moved or, or taken off as if it's been prepared for surgery. So that, provably that has not been you know, done by an animal. And this animal had internal organs removed from a hole which appears to be too small for those organs to fit. This case in Argentina in the year 2000, that cow was a perfect healthy specimen the day before that photograph was taken. It had broken legs, so it looked like it had been dropped from a height. And it had the classic jaw strip you can see there. Uh, now this animal, um, Again, it, it had had all of its internal organs removed, but the only orifice on the body was a, a hole in its rectum about, about 15 centimeters in diameter, and its brain had been removed from that hole as well. And the, the farmer um, telephoned the police and the sheriff, and a veterinary pathologist came along to cut the thing open, and they opened it up, and it was completely empty, with just a hole this size, and like I say, running around perfectly healthy the day before. And there's, there we see the hole there, not very pretty. Okay, and I, like I said, ears are often removed, cleanly excised, and quite often it's just the one ear. And the same with the jaw strip, quite often just one side. And in this particular case, um, an ear was removed, and as farmers do, they tag their animals with these tags which go through the ear. That whatever had done it had no need for the tag, so they just left that on the ground. But, there was, but the carcass was there with no ear. And as I mentioned before, holes in the ventral neck area where on occasion all of the animal's blood is removed. Now, when an animal dies, 
if it's got a wound, it will pump out about 60% of its blood before its cardiovascular system collapses and it dies. So there's always blood left in the body. But some of these bodies, they have no blood left in them. There's no blood on the grass, there's no blood on the carcass, no blood in the carcass. So some kind of technology has to have been applied in order to remove all that blood. The heart isn't capable of pumping it out. Okay. So here are some of the characteristics. There's never any traces of blood on the ground, um, never any uh, tracks or footprints near or around these cases. Often they're in remote, inhospitable locations. And as I said, lights are sometimes witnessed. Now, helicopters are also sometimes witnessed. So people pass this off, they say, well, the lights were helicopters, okay? And on many occasions, they probably are helicopters, but you might say, well, are the helicopters chasing the orbs? Or are the helicopters tidying up after whatever is doing this? So it's not necessarily the military people in the helicopters that are carrying out these attacks. And occasionally, um, Phil Hoyle in particular has found ground markings near locations of where um, mutilations have taken place. I've got some photographs. This one, it's about six meters in diameter, so about a foot wide. I'll just zoom in on it there. And apparently, the grass doesn't grow for years and years afterwards. It becomes very baked. Okay. Now, um, and again, it's not just farm animals. Tony Dodd, who's a, he passed away last year, he wrote this book, and he was a police sergeant in North Yorkshire, and he was interested in the UFO phenomenon and he became sort of a if anyone had a mutilation case it would get sent to Tony Dodd so he, he had many many cases in Yorkshire and he said that he would sometimes the, there would be a field where there would be a fox a badger and a, and a sheep all mutilated so there's no kind of relationship between the animals it wasn't just sheep so sometimes it was wild animals as well and occasionally domestic animals it's a worldwide phenomenon there have been cases in Argentina a lot in America and Scandinavia and this is the one thing that intrigues me the most, and that is the fact that they are very, very covert in nature. Nobody has ever been witnessed, ever been arrested, shot with a shotgun, seen running away, ever. And there are thousands of instances of this kind. No one's ever been caught. We'll come on to that. Um, and there are hotspots of activity. It's not happening everywhere. There's a hotspot which is just west of Shrewsbury, there's a hotspot on Dartmoor, and in the past there's been hotspots in the Whitby and Scarborough area. Let's look at the possible explanations for what's actually going on here. Now we mentioned animal predation, and I completely rule that out for all of, because of all of the evidence I've already presented. A lot of people suggest satanic cults, and you know, they do get up to some weird things. But I don't think that the evidence I've presented suggests satanic cults. I think that they, they don't leave evidence about for what they're doing because you know they get arrested no one's ever been caught and some people say well it's a secret government project it could be um, I'm open to that idea um, that it's a, perhaps a pharmaceutical company using these animals for some sort of secret research the military maybe maybe they're sampling the environment or something like that quite possible but I would refer you back to the covert nature of these attacks if it's if it is this then they've got some damn sophisticated technology and on balance, I would say they haven't got that technology, okay? And we need to bear in mind that there may be more than one project, okay? There might be people trying to copy what's going on. There might be more than one motive for these attacks. But I'm going to give you my preferred theory on what is going on, okay? Um, now, this is, again, there's no proof of this, but this is because it explains all of the evidence, and, I, and I'll, I'll point out why. And that is that the animals are being used as incubators for antibodies or other biological agents. And this, for me, it explains all of the evidence, and I'll, I'll explain why. In 1899, a scientist called Metchnikoff, he took infected uh, mouse cells from the lymph gland and he injected them into guinea pigs. The guinea pigs grew antibodies, and then he injected those antibodies back into the mice. So he cured the mice, so the mice weren't capable of growing those antibodies. So he used a guinea pig. So he used one species to create antibodies for another. And there are many, many cases in medical science of this. For example, you know, 
vaccines. Or off, we often use like you know, monkey's liver or kidneys to make vaccines with. It's amazing, but they do. Um, the H1N1 vaccine is made inside a chicken's egg. So they're using the, the, the physiology of a chicken to make the thing that we need as a vaccine. And there's a thing called antithymocyte globulin, which is used in a, acute rejection of organ transplant, which is derived from horses or rabbits. So there are many cases where you, you can use one animal to grow something that another animal needs. And I think that's possibly what's happening in these cases. Um, now, I'm going to put it all together because how does this explain the jaw strip and the tongue removal? What I think is happening is they've got an animal that they want to grow something inside. They, they, put the, they inject that animal with whatever agent it is, virus, whatever. They then tag that animal because at some point in the future they then need to find that animal after it's grown the relevant antibodies. So they tag it and they tag it in the jaw with an implant or in the ear. They then leave the thing three months, six months. Later on, they then use their tr the tracking device to find that animal. They then kill the animal. They then cut the tongue off and then use the tissue of the tongue to test to see if it's got what they want. And then when you go to the doctors, they, the first thing they say is, put your tongue out, I want to see how well you are. So it's a, a means of testing. So they test the tongue. They say, yep, it's got what we want. They examinate the blood and take the organs that they want. And the last thing they do before they leave you strip the jaw off to remove the implant or the ear, depending on whether the implant is in the jaw or the ear, it's because they don't want to leave any evidence of this advanced tracking device. And then they just leave the carcass there. Unfortunately, this explanation is to me totally unsatisfactory. There is no reason for this to be done in an uncontrolled environment. This is not how scientific research is done. It is done in a controlled environment. They would do it in private, on private land, with animals they owned and controlled. There is no reason that I can see for them doing this to wild animals or to animals that belong to some random farmer, or for them to leave the mess behind to be found. I would suggest that the culprit may be an unknown platyhelminthus, probably most similar to the blood flukes. First, it is important to explain what platyhelminthus are. It is also important to look at the life cycles of these things that can be very diverse and complicated. Um, it's which includes flat worms, which are unsegmented, bilaterally symmetrical worms. Flatworms show a definite level of organization. They are the first and the simplest organisms having an organ system. Flatworms do not have a definite skeleton, but have a cuticle which protects their bodies. Flatworms have a highly branched cut with a mouth where the anus is absent. A muscular sectorial phalanx is present for taking in the food. Flatworms mark the beginning of cephalization. Cephalization is a development in the head region of light sensitive organs called ocelli. Platyhelminthes is further divided into three classes. Turbularia is the first and most basic group. The second class in Platyhelminthes is the class Trematoda, or the parasitic flukes. These go through two life stages. Some part of their life they're in their sexual phase where they're reproducing with gametes, and then part they're asexual and can produce by budding. One characteristic is that they go through at least two hosts as they're a parasite. Here's a diagram showing the life cycle of the liver fluke. It passes through part of its life stage in large mammals such as cattle, sheep, or humans, and then spends another part of its life cycle in snails, moving between these two stages in order to complete a full life cycle. The parasitic flukes, in this case we're talking about liver flukes, their larvae become insisted or encased for long periods of time in organs. The picture in the lower right is showing a slice of liver with this little cyst and the parasite that was in there. Over a long period of time, this causes enormous amounts of damage to It's a life-threatening disease and cause that's caused by the parasitic worm Schistosoma hematobium. The Schistosoma hematobium parasite infests the blood vessels around the host's bladder. There, it reproduces rapidly, laying millions of microscopic eggs, which are excreted in the urine. In rare cases, when the eggs pass out of the body, they come into contact with the skin. If this happens, they can become lodged in the skin, creating a fiery red rash. But Schistosoma hematobium can be much more dangerous than just a rash. As the schistosomes lay eggs inside the bladder, the immune response grows, creating inflammation and damaging the surrounding tissue. 
Eventually, this can result in a massive buildup of dead tissue. And that buildup is correlated with the onset of cancer. And that can cause a big problem for the host. Schistosomes begin life as eggs in fresh water. The larvae swim about in search of the parasite's intermediate host, a snail. They invade the snail's soft, fleshy tissue, where they mature and multiply. When the snail dies, the schistosomes return to the water before burrowing through the skin of their primary host, a human. The World Health Organization estimates that 200 million people worldwide have schistosomiasis. The final class in the phylum platyhelminthes are the class cestoda. These are the tapeworms. They're intestinal parasites that anchor to the side of the intestine using their head. The head has a specialized structure called the scolex that contains hooks and suckers allowing them to attach into the intestine and not move along and pass along with the digested food. Class cestoda, or the tapeworms, absorb pre-digested material directly from their host. Without a gut, intestines, stomach, or any real digestive system, they're merely absorbing material from their surroundings. And the gut was likely lost in evolution because it's unnecessary. After the head and scolex comes the major part of their body, the proglottids. These proglottids are repeated units that form behind the scolex. Given that they're hermaphroditic, they'll have both male and female reproductive organs in their proglottids, and they're actually able to fertilize themselves. Here's a little closer look at that same diagram. On the far left, you can see the head and scolex with the hooks and suckers. And then in the middle and far right, you can see a close-up view of the proglottids and the many structures and organs that are found in the proglottids. The old ones are at the far end, and they're able to break off with eggs contained within them. And they're able to leave the body of the host with their feces and then hopefully infect other new hosts. Here's some images of pork tapeworms. These adult tapeworms can become two to seven meters long and contain over a thousand proglottids. In those proglottids, you can have up to 50,000 eggs at a time that could potentially go on to infect other hosts. Here's a diagram showing two tapeworms that can infect humans, the cattle tapeworm and the pig tapeworm. Both of these will spend part of their life cycle insisted in muscle and then move on to the intestines where they can then lodge and complete their life cycle. It is important to understand that there are very likely to be unknown platyhelminthes, and that of those that are known, many of their life cycles are not fully understood. There are many creatures, particularly small ones, that remain undiscovered, some we only know of because of the evidence they leave behind. One classic example is Paleodictyon nodosum. It is possible that this parasite is an insect or lies within another group of animals. Or maybe a platyhelimenthes working in conjunction with an insect host. When raised in a controlled environment under the right conditions, they can strip a skull in two days or less. This footage is being used to demonstrate how small animals can very quickly consume flesh and clean it to the bone. The platyhelimenthes hypothesis cannot explain animals being dropped from great heights broken legs or animals being dragged or being found in inexplicable places such as in trees or on top of telegraph poles. However, this can be easily explained by the military trying to encourage the notion of alien involvement and in them trying to cause researchers into the phenomenon confusion. The liver fluke burrows into a part of the ant's brain, and for unknown reasons, it's almost like the fluke enslaves the ants and orders them to carry it to their next hosts. Any grazing mammal host with a nice warm liver will do, but in this case, a cow appears. The liver fluke worms can switch the ant's behavior on and off, causing the infected ants to place themselves in easy-to-eat positions of dust when mammals are feeding. No cows in sight, ants act normal. Cows appear, ants are in essence ordered to take their positions in purple flowers and latch on. The cows ingest the vegetation, the ants, and the fluke larvae inside the ants all in one bite. Once inside the cow, the worms burrow out of the stomach and into the liver, where they develop into adults and dine on liver tissue. They lay eggs that are excreted from the liver into the bile duct, and then defecated by the cows. They don't kill the cows, but the cows become weak and emaciated, devastating herds. And all because of parasitic mind control. So here is how I suggest it takes place. Animal consumes parasite in egg, cyst or larval form, probably from the ground. It may be deliberately infected by the military. Parasite enters blood through the gut lining. It may remain dormant for a long time. 
The parasite begins to replicate in the blood asexually, creating thousands if not millions of itself. These begin to grow, consuming the blood. The animal will at first notice no ill effects, and no ill effects will be apparent. These parasites will continue to get larger to the point that they can no longer fit through the capillaries. The larvae have not yet finished growing and need to keep their host alive. So although they feast on the caterpillar's blood, they have been careful not to touch a single one of its vital organs. This uneasy truce will not last. It is possible that these parasites use haemoglobin and mimic the animal's red blood cells, transporting oxygen for the animal whilst consuming the blood and replacing it, allowing the parasite to keep the host animal alive for longer so that it can complete its life cycle. This is just an idea, there is no evidence for it. At this point in its life cycle, the parasite begins to change into a different form of itself. Now too large to navigate the blood circulatory system, it begins to move into and consume specific soft tissues, continuing to both replicate and change. This happens very rapidly. It consumes the soft tissues of the specific organs within hours of this change taking place. They may well be able to detect using the animal's own hormones and circadian rhythms that it is night time, when this always seems to occur. There may be an evolutionary benefit to this as predators such as birds are less likely to be around. At this point there may well be a sexual stage of reproduction. To complete the next stage of their life cycle, they must break out. Having consumed the nutritional content of the soft tissues, the parasite then must escape the carcass by the easiest and shortest route, continuing to consume flesh as they go, often through the mouth and anus, consuming more tissue as they go, consuming the rectum, tongue and jaw flesh. Sometimes they exit the carcass through a hole in the side of the animal, if the mouth and or anus is blocked. Also, the ear and eye and neck seem to be a common escape route. But as their bodies have grown, they have developed tiny, saw-like teeth. These jagged jaws are for one job only. Cutting their way out. Stroke by stroke, the larvae slice through the tough layers of skin. The parasites may secrete powerful digestive juices. At the same time, they release chemicals that paralyze the caterpillar. The exit wounds occur mostly on one side. Probably because the animal has collapsed onto its side, the parasites instinctively eat their way upward and out the animal. The parasites in their thousands or millions then disappear, leaving no trace of themselves. They may become airborne, however it is most likely they burrow back into the ground, where a new part of its life cycle begins. Eventually they will transform back into the form that the animal consumed in the first place, ready for the next unfortunate herbivore to come along and consume it. This stage of the life cycle may involve another animal or plant host. This stage of the life cycle may lay dormant for a long period of time in a near indestructible egg or cyst form that may be microscopic in size. When you look at the wide variety of complex life cycles amongst the platyhelminthus, this is plausible but just a hypothesis. There may be many species of this parasite, so it is not going to be the same every time. Each species may target a specific animal, or may be able to attack any animal within a group, and may have a preference for certain specific soft tissues. Free at last, the larvae enter a new phase of development. They swiftly spin silken cocoons. These will provide the perfect environment for their final transformation. One of the greatest dangers the larvae will face is being themselves impregnated by other species of parasitic wasp. Incredibly, the wounded caterpillar helps them out. Usually, a caterpillar would spin a silken blanket to make its own cocoon. But the parasitized caterpillar spins his blanket on top of the wasp cocoons, giving them an extra layer of protection. Scientists believe the same wasp virus that infected it weeks before has now invaded the caterpillar's brain and caused this bizarre corruption of its normal behavior. Amazingly, the caterpillar's natural aggression is now also exploited by the wasp virus. The caterpillar becomes a bodyguard, actively protecting the cocoon. 
the kingdom from other parasites. It will watch over them unceasingly until it eventually starves to death. Bloody holy bloody fucking menthes.